This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. So we're talking about an, an anthropology of signs here, really. Uh, that's the objective. So again, just to review, the idea here behind these three talks is to use the structure of the Summa itself as the backdrop and kind of as the ordering principle. So we had the first talk, uh, broadly speaking, was about the prima pars, so God and the reality he creates in and of itself, including us, right? Uh, the second part is about the identity of the human person, both according to the human person's essence, uh, like what, is, what does it mean to be a human creature, both personally and communally, and then also what does it mean to uh, be engaged in human acts, right? So virtues, um, so that was yesterday, and there we developed, a, we, so we saw the concept of sign uh, woven into both of those sections of the Summa Theologiae, right? It's super important for the way that we know God, and then the way that we understand reality in light of divine exemplarity. So when we talk about aesthetics or um, artistic production, or even a sort of aesthetic sensibility uh, about reality, for Aquinas, uh, we, we really have to be talking about the doctrine of analogy and signs at some level. Right. Um, if we want our sensibilities, our aesthetic sensibilities, to be framed by divine exemplarity, which is really what Aquinas wants. And that's, the, that's what gives our vision of reality a sapiential quality, as Aquinas would say, that it's, it's ordered, as it were, that our perception of reality is ordered uh, according to the way things actually are. And not just the way things are like in and of themselves as individual things, but the way they are in relation to their creator. Right? So you, it develops a kind of sapiential aesthetic, we might say, uh, Aquinas does in the Prima Pars, where we come to see all of reality, visible creation, uh, tactile sensory creation, uh, in light of the one who's made it in his own image and likeness, and, and including ourselves, right, as a special image of God. Okay, we also saw yesterday, we saw how important uh, the category of sign is again for understanding the, the, the human act, <laughs> Uh, construed in both personal and communal terms. So what I want to do today is look at those same, let's call it a kind of anthropological vocabulary for the importance of sign, considered both personally and communally. I want to take that vocabulary and look at how in the Tertia Pars, and that's the part that deals with the incarnation and the sacraments. So what is God, how has God um, re-encountered us after original sin? How does he recreate the world? That's the Tertia Pars. So I want to look at how that sort of vocabulary, that anthropological vocabulary of sign, personal and communal sign, um, how that gets cashed out in the actions of Jesus Christ, um, and then uh, particularly in the Eucharist as a special kind of sign in which the, the actions, if you will, of Jesus Christ are instrumentally present, as they are in all the sacraments. But because the Eucharist is such um, uh, an incredibly uh, vivid sign, Right? Uh, that it, it forms a kind of archetype uh, for a sacramental understanding of reality. So we'll look at how the, the activity of Christ uh, is, is present in the Eucharist according to sign. Um, okay, so that's the plan for today. All right. So as a whole, the Tertia Pars is focused on the meaning of the incarnation and its effects. Aquinas begins the prologue of this third and final section of the Summa by quoting the explanation of the virgin birth that was given to Joseph in a dream. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Expanding on this, Aquinas explains that this salvation is accomplished through Christ, who shows us the way of, who shows us the way of truth, through which the resurrection to beatitude and immortal life becomes possible for us. Recall that for Aquinas, the Summa is ordered according to the pattern of reality itself, rather than the more limited and specific pedagogical aims of a human instructor. Accordingly, for Aquinas, the theological consideration of the incarnation forms a fitting consummation to the study of theology itself. Having already studied the final end of human life, and both virtue and vice, as he begins the final section of the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas turns his attention to that which belongs to Christ as Savior and the benefits that he bestows on our humanity. Accordingly, Aquinas divides the contents of the Tertia Pars into three main sections. Uh, the first concerns the mystery of the Incarnation itself, 
Second, the sacraments of Christ by which salvation is communicated. And third, the final resurrection and immortal life. Aquinas died before completing the third part of these sections, uh, even leaving the final portion itself completely un undone. In fact, even the second part isn't complete. Um, you may encounter, if you have a copy of the Summa, something called the Supplementum, which is what it sounds like. It's a supplement uh, that his students sort of filled in, uh, using his commentary on the sentences and some class notes after he was already dead. It completes the structure, although we wish, of course, that Aquinas had completed it himself. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we'll be dealing with material from the earlier sections of the Tertia Pars today that Aquinas actually wrote. Um, okay, so uh, let's begin by talking about Christ's priesthood. So here we see, if you recall, when we talked about the Secunda Pars, um, the act of religion, uh, it has an outward sign that perfects the inward act, right? So the outward acts perfect the inward acts. They, an individual can commit outward acts uh, in a general sense. You're certainly capable right, of forming signs of your inner intent. But the outward act of religion itself really requires a, some kind of legislation or, or, or um, either from God himself or from some kind of authority to specify uh, the external act. Um, and that's partially because of the significance for the concept of religion under justice for the community as a whole and the common good understood in that sense and not just the private good of an individual. If you recall also, Aquinas made a point of, of connecting the idea of priesthood to that idea of specificity. So beyond more general senses of religion or religiosity, that there is a co-relativity, as Aquinas would say, between the concept of a priesthood and this idea of, of sort of public and corporate sacrifice, a kind of public dispensation. Um, he doesn't go so far as to say that it always and everywhere has to be that way. For instance, God can do what he wants. He could legislate differently, but there is a fittingness in the order of wisdom. Right? So when he talks about Christ's priesthood, he's really expanding on those ideas and showing us how the, the humanity that Christ assumes is perfecting by its union with divinity that basic anthropology that all of us have. Okay, so in the first article of question 22 of the Tertia Pars, Aquinas establishes that it is indeed fitting for Christ to be a priest, taking the definition of priesthood given in Hebrews 5, every high priest is taken from among men and made their representative before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So invoking this text, Aquinas argues that the priesthood is eminently fitting for Christ because of the gift of reconciliation that he has given to the human family. Building on this, in the second article of, the, of this same question, Aquinas turns his attention to the nature of Christ's sacrificial offering itself. In this text, Aquinas begins by citing a text from the 10th book of Augustine's City of God. That's the same text he used in the Secunda Pars when talking about our humanity, or humanity in general. So in this text, Augustine argues that when considered as a, sac as, as a sacred sign, Every visible sacrifice is, in fact, a sacrament of the invisible sacrifice. Recalling the earlier distinction between interior and exterior sacrifices that he employed in both the Prima Secunde and the Secunda Secunde, here in his consideration of Christ's priesthood, Aquinas uses this text from the City of God in conjunction with the text of Psalm 51, which he also employed in his description of sacrifice as a human act in question 85 of the Secunda Secunde. In the following text of the corpus of Article 2, Aquinas will continue to turn to the concept of sacrifice as a human act to provide the context for understanding Christ himself as a priest in a preeminent sense. Concerning the human condition more generally, Aquinas gives three causal explanations for the reasons for sacrifice from an anthropological perspective. So here he's even expanding on some of the anthropology that he gave us in the Secunda Pars, uh, asking why sacrifice would be necessary for the human condition. Because it's here, of course, in the Tertia Pars that he's actually, um, he's uh, providing the answer to that why, as it were, the, the formality that responds to the question. So according to Aquinas, sacrifice is offered for the remission of those sins which have turned humanity from God, to be pre preserved in the state of grace, that's the second reason, and the third is to be perfected in spiritual unity with God the full perfection of which is found in the state of glory. 
So this threefold pattern, uh, that is uh, the remission of sins, the preservation of the state of grace, and then the perfection of the state of grace, that's the sort of um, anthropological scope of the human act of sacrifice, um, both according to nature and according to grace in Jesus Christ, that he's going to, to game out here in the Church of Pars. In the case of sacrifices offered for sins, Aquinas refers to the same text from Hebrews uh, that he cited above, um, arguing that the role of the priesthood itself is defined in relation to this same fundamental anthropological need for atonement. In the case of his second and third anthropological reasons for sacrifice, so that's preservation in the state of grace and perfection of the same, Aquinas offers specific correlates to each of these kinds of sacrifice from the sacrificial precepts of the old law. In the case of sacrifices that preserve the person in grace, Aquinas likens such sacrifices to those peace offerings uh, sacrificed off and offered for the salvation of those offering the sacrifices in the old temple. In the third and final case, Aquinas draws a comparison between those sacrifices which unite the human soul to God in this life and in the finality of glory and the Holocaust offerings made under the old law, noting that in such Holocaust offerings, that which was offered was entirely burnt. If you recall in the Secunda Secunde, um, when you talk about sacrifice as a special act of the virtue of religion with a specific definition, something has to change or even be consumed. And Aquinas used a Eucharistic metaphor in addition to some allusions to the old law as well. But here, you know, he's moving, using um, uh, the text from Hebrews here, he's moving to position Christ's priesthood itself as a kind of Holocaust offering and a, and a supreme sacrifice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so turning to the specific case of Christ's humanity, Aquinas argues that the effects obtained by such sacrifices, forgiveness of sins, the preservation and grace and union with God, are given by means of Christ's humanity. So... One of the governing concepts uh, at work in the Tertia of Pars is that of the, the instrumentality of Christ's humanity. That when we say his humanity is an instrument, uh, we're saying it's an animate instrument, a living instrument conjoined to his divinity, by which our salvation is affected. Uh, we'll see also that the sacraments become other types of instruments, but they're uh, separated instruments, to use Aquinas' language. So they're more like a stick in the hand, or an axe in the hand of a builder, as opposed to the arm of the same builder. Uh, so you have divinity, conjoined humanity, and then other types of signs. All of these are signs, though. His humanity is a sign, and then even the, the bread and wine of the Eucharist, the water of baptism, become uh, extensions of the, the same signate quality, if you will, of the incarnation itself. Um, so turning to the specific case of, Aquinas uh, of, of Christ's humanity, rather, um, Aquinas argues that the effects obtained by the such sacrifice are given by means of Christ's humanity. So for Aquinas, however, Christ's humanity functions as both priest and as perfect sacrificial offering. So he's both, effectively, uh, fulfilling all three senses of sacrifice as an offering for sin, a peace offering, and as a holocaust. In his response to the objections, Aquinas emphasizes the complete freedom of Christ, who truly offered himself to death without external compulsion. Concerning the volitional responsibility of Christ's death, However, Aquinas does not allow the freedom he attributes to Christ's self-offering to obscure the moral responsibility of those who actively killed him. So um, what kind of offering are we talking about? Um, if you think of it just as a physical external offering, and Christ is both priest and victim, you might run into a problem in the sense that he would be somehow the moral agent of his own death. Uh, and that's probably not quite what we want to say, right? Um, you probably also don't want to say that those who actively killed him were offering a true sacrifice. You might not want to say that either. Um, so um, Aquinas is careful to avoid those. So he's positioning uh, the act of religion in a special sense here where Christ is both priest and offering. Okay. So the status of Christ's humanity as a proper sacrificial offering cannot be associated with the human acts of those who killed him as if he were offered as a proper act of sacrifice according to the malice of his accusers, for instance. But rather, the volitional dimension of this sacrifice is attributed solely to Christ, reinforcing Aquinas' position that in the self-oblation of his humanity, Christ is both priest and victim. So it's that internal act of the virtue of religion that's important for Aquinas here when he's talking about Christ's humanity. It's, and the external offering is a sign thereof, uh, as a means thereof. 
it's the offering of his will, uh, effectively. Um, it's that oblation, that interior offering, that forms the, the core of his priesthood. The rest is, is signs. So for Aquinas, however, it's not only important to establish that Christ is a priest and victim in a general sense. Aquinas works to show that Christ is a perfect priest and victim, and that his perfection in these categories translates into a most perfect result with respect to those finalities of forgiveness, grace, and union. In his response to the second objection, the same question, question 22, still, if you're interested, Aquinas connects the daily Eucharistic offering of the church to Christ's offering. This is still in the context of Christ's priesthood, right? uh, arguing that the former is not distinct from the latter, but is rather a commemoration of Christ's self-offering. So already you have the humanity of Christ in its external acts as a sign of interior intent. Then you have the Eucharist already emerging as a kind of memorial or a sign of what Christ has done. So the, the way he positions sign in all this is just going to be super important for us. Um, the daily commemorative offering of the Mass functions to extend the efficacy of Christ's singular sacrifice throughout time, reaching those who have not yet converted those who have fallen away from the practice of the faith, and many others in need of the satisfaction for sin, perseverance in grace, and union with God that Christ's sacrifice offers. So because he's assumed a full human nature um, it, through the hypostatic union, what Christ does in our nature is satisfies for the nature itself, you might say, at an essential level. But then the question of application throughout time is a question that the sacraments start to answer. And it's the vocabulary of sign that allows us to say uh, that something from the past has been led to give an effect in the present, or even in the case of the Eucharist, that it's, it's present in a sense, uh, without disrupting the, the finality of the past. That is, without saying that Christ has to keep repeating it over and over again for each person. There's a sense of divine exemplarity at, at work in that, which isn't that dissimilar from what he lays out in the Prima Pars, where God, as, as cause of all that is, the cause of causes, is um, not only responsible for a kind of one-time created act for each thing, but governs the essence and the final acts of all, of all creation outside of time. So something similar is happening in recreation. So let's look a little bit at Christ's passion. So when we look at, uh, so what does Christ do uh, as a kind of external offering of himself? This is question 46 in the Tertia Pars. So Aquinas begins this question, uh, or in this question rather, Aquinas begins his direct consideration of Christ's passion. In his treatment of Christ's priesthood, Aquinas emphasized that Christ's offering as a priest was fully volitional, free from any outside compulsion. In his treatment of Christ's passion itself, Aquinas builds on this, emphasizing that, although not necessary in the absolute sense, or the result of divine compulsion, as if God had to do any of these things. Uh, Christ's passion is also not without a fitting ratio of its own, so it's also not arbitrary. More than physical pain alone, and the suffering that it causes in the lower faculties of the soul, for Aquinas, Christ's offering included an interior suffering that encompassed the whole of Christ's soul in such a way that the very essence of Christ's soul can be said to suffer even as the higher faculties of his reason remain fixed on God as their object. So notice, remember, the whole point of the virtue of religion is to raise the mind to God. And that concept, is, that's what makes sense of Christ's priestly offering here for Aquinas, that his, his, the gaze of his mind, despite the, um, a suffering which encompasses the essence of the soul, and that's basically a direct quote from the Tertia Pars, right? That the, the whole of his, of his being, not just in its, its physicality or in the lower nature, but the whole of his being has been caught up in his suffering. But the offering, right, uh, the raising of the mind to God, it, it doesn't waver, right? Um, even in Christ's speculative intellect, Aquinas will say, um, the effects of his suffering are felt. Uh, although the joy that results from the contemplation of divine truth is not vitiated, nevertheless, because like all of the, because, like all of the soul's powers, the intellective powers are connected to the other, lower powers of the soul, by virtue of the soul's essence. The pain experienced there is experienced intellectually as well. So it's almost as if it trickles upwards, sort of, from the, the tremendous exterior suffering of his body uh, to, um, to affect even his speculative intellect. 
So this approach in no way downplays the physicality of the cross, uh, but it, it allows that suffering to remain focused on a particular type of human act in the humanity of Christ, right? That's, that's really the salvific part, rather than just the, the external physicality. Um, so by virtue of this same essential unity of soul, the same that allows the whole thing to suffer, um, the fruits of the passion experienced directly in the higher parts of the soul, uh, these are predicated of the entirety of the soul as well. Uh, so rather than an isolated speculation, in the context of the passion aspects of Aquinas' teaching on the union of Christ's speculative intellect with both God as its formal object and the experiences of the lower faculties reflect his broader teaching on the nature of sacrifice more generally. Um, so just as things trickle up, the, the pain from outside, the, the fruits from his act of religion, uh, as it were, trickle down and out, right? uh, sanctifying the whole of his humanity. So just recalling the Secunda Pars here in question 85 in the Secunda Secunda, which we spent um, a bunch of time with yesterday. In question 85, Psalm 51, uh, which he cites again here, is used to show that a contrite heart is the beginning and principle of all sacrifice. In this text, this internal sacrifice represents the internal acts of the virtue of religion. That's the way Aquinas uses it back in question 85 of which the external act of sacrifice is an outward sign. <clears throat> in this interior sacrifice, the soul offers itself to God as a kind of self-oblation. Therefore, and that's just in the case of the virtue of religion, before we even talk about Christ's priesthood of the cross. So therefore, Aquinas' claim that Christ's speculative intellect remains fixed on God as its end, even as it remains united with him, uh, re reunited rather, with the suffering of his human flesh, seems to fulfill an integral dimension of Aquinas' own understanding of sacrifice as a proper human act. In the context of his consideration of Christ's passion, therefore, Aquinas' insistence on this point can be understood within the context of the perfection of religion as a human act. Further, when read in conjunction with his treatment of Christ's priesthood, the significance of this perfection emerges with greater force. As the perfect sacrifice and the perfect priest, the raising of Christ's intellect to the Father on the cross emerges as a supreme self-oblation. So let's talk about Christ's sacrifice um, a little bit, which is different than his passion. So it seems like it might be the same, but it's actually a different question of the Tertia Pars. So in the, he's, he's talking, he's laying the groundwork in question 46 uh, for how... Um, He's leading you towards the virtue of religion. But now he's going to, he's, so he's established basically that it is an act of sacrifice, right? By saying so directly, <laughs> but also using a lot of the same texts and concepts he used in the Secunda Pars. But now he's going to talk about Christ's sacrifice itself. And this is question 48. Um, <clears throat> so um, in this question, Aquinas takes up the efficacy of Christ's passion. So we know that it's a true sacrifice and a supreme sacrifice, but how does it work uh, on our behalf? we might ask, right? Uh, we know that its effects uh, contradict sin, both the, um, uh, the, the effects of original sin, preserve us in grace, and also perfect us for beatific life. But we need to say a little bit more, right, before we connect some of those dots to ourselves. Right? Okay. Um, so here, uh, Aquinas is examining Christ's passion as a cause of our salvation, the language of causality again asking whether Christ's passion causes our salvation through the modalities of merit, satisfaction, sacrifice, redemption, and efficient causality. We won't examine all of those here, <laughs> but we'll focus particularly on, on sacrifice as a kind of cause. Uh, so in the case of Christ's passion as a sacrifice, Aquinas begins by offering a general definition of sacrifice as something that is done to honor God and to please him. Again, similar to what he said in the Secunda Pars. So um, here sacrifice as a properly Christian concept is not understood as a subspecies of a more generic category. Rather, it is that Christ's sacrifice itself becomes the archetype for all other uses of the term. And here there's an, there's an interesting connection with the concept of charity, which helps us actually in some ways to better understand, I would argue, what Aquinas is saying, or at least what he's implying as a possible fulfillment in the Secunda Pars for our humanity as well. And it has to do with the concept of charity, which we understand as a theological virtue uh, in terms of faith, hope, and charity. 
Um, but it's also the queen, as it were, of all virtue when we have it. It serves as a general virtue that can operate others. The same way the virtue of justice can function. A charity in a far more supreme way can operate all of our faculties and all that we are. And that's really what perfection and grace looks like in the final analysis. Okay, so charity is important. Um, so again, this is, a, again, in the Tertiary Pars in 48. Um, he uses a text from the City of God as well, uh, and also from Augustine's On the Trinity, um, which he's, uh, he's used before. Um, but here, this, uh, this Augustinian text from the City of God in particular, this is Book 10, The City of God, um, Augustine argues that sacrifice is in the true and proper sense, that it should be understood within the context of charity, right, as a bond that unites the person to God. So there are some differences between Aquinas and Augustine on this point, but the importance of charity isn't one of them. <laughs> so in his own argument, as he incorporates Augustine's perspective in the city of God, Aquinas chooses to quote the closing lines of this same chapter, again, from the city of God. So it's, it's book six, uh, chapter six, rather, of book 10 of the city of God, if you're interested, in which Augustine argues that this one sacrifice of Christ was prefigured and signed by the multitude of offerings signifying Christ's one sacrifice in the same way that a single reality can be indicated by many different words. Although Aquinas does not quote this text directly, Augustine himself concludes this chapter uh, by observing that all false sacrifices have now given way to the true and supreme sacrifice that is found in Christ. For Aquinas, these Augustinian texts demonstrate clearly that Christ's passion is a true sacrifice offered freely and received according to the ratio of charity. And that this charity is not only something that Christ has, but it has the, the possibility, or the ability rather, to perfect our acts of sacrifice as well. Um, there's a specific text, if you go back to the Secunda Pars, um, when he's talking about the first act of religion, that interior act of devotion, of devotio, where he makes a connection uh, with the the contemplative object of charity, in which God is considered his first object, and the act of devotion. He doesn't say de true devotion can't happen without it, um, but it's pretty clear they're meant to work together, right? So you, you might say that charity, this type of priestly charity that comes from Jesus Christ, is the, the context in which true religion can unfold, certainly for us in the state of grace. Well, let's move ahead a little bit to talk about the Eucharist with the time we have left. Uh, so we've talked about the the instrumentality of Christ's humanity, and the way in which the, the anthropological categories, if you will, of his humanity, the specificity of his anthropology, is working for our benefit as he offers himself as a priest and as a victim on the cross. Um, we could use any of the sacraments to talk about the way in which his humanity becomes uh, present to us through the medium of signs, but the Eucharist is a particularly um, effective uh, lens, let's say, for talking about sign because it's so complex and you really see the way in which the Christological reality um, of grace itself, what Christ has accomplished, comes to be mediated to us both as a, an event from the past, an event in the present, and an event uh, that is yet to come or yet to reach its total fulfillment. So question 60 in the Church of Pars represents a hinge point. Uh, this is the, the point where um, Aquinas starts talking about the sacraments as kind of... Um, uh, separated instruments, he'll say, right? So the stick in the hand or the tool in the hand of the carpenter. In his said contra of his first article in the sacraments, Aquinas cites a familiar text, again, from the city of God. It's a book he likes, right? Uh, especially when he's talking about the sacraments. It is, it's all over the place. Um, and uh, it's a great book. You should read it if you haven't. Um, Aquinas did, obviously. Um, <laughs> so... Um, and this is, again, it's uh, the city of God on sacred signs, right? So it's Augustine's understanding of sign uh, that's uh, influenced Aquinas quite strongly um, in, in all of these conversations. So in the city of God, as a sacred sign, the visible sacrifice is the sacrament of the invisible sacrifice. Um, I should note, as a, as a, just as a side point, this particular quote from Augustine, super popular, mostly because Peter Lombard uses it a lot, and everyone, when they talk about the sacraments, will fall back on some of these texts. Uh, it is clear, though, that Aquinas has actually read The City of God uh, for himself, uh, rather than just reading Peter Lombard, uh, I think, because he quotes a lot of other texts, too, right, that uh, aren't in Lombard. Um, okay. So in the Tertia of Pars, the concept of visible sacrifice, um, uh, and again, that's Augustine's division between the indivisible and visible sacrifices. The sacrament of the invisible sacrifice is the visible one, the exterior one. Okay. 
Um, in the Tertia Pars, the visible sacrifice will be applied to the sacraments of the church, perhaps unsurprisingly, right? Uh, but in both cases, in the case of both sacrifices, the category of sign is used to link a present visible reality with an invisible one. In the case of human acts, to say that the external act is a sign of the internal one attributes a causal role to the interior act as a principle of the outward one. So again, here he's reviewing some of his uh, some of the metaphysics that we saw in the last two lectures. So when you say there's a signate link between two things, you're also saying there's a causal link because there's a link at the level of being. So um, it's it's almost always a statement about causality, right? Um, almost always, or at least in in most uh, sort of boilerplate examples that you could come up with. Uh, and all that is to say that there's some sort of ontological link, right, at the level of being. So sign means something about reality. It's not just an ephemeral illusion. Uh, real signs lead someplace. Um, okay, so in the second section of the Tertia Pars, which is the sacraments part that we're moving into here, the category of sign will emerge as the means by which this participation in Christ's sacrifice is affected. So um, if his passion is a cause of our sanctification, which we hold, right? <laughs> um, Signs are the means by which that causal efficacy is communicated. So in most cases, um, signate and causal realities are, are in, enmeshed with each other. Uh, if you think about the, the woodcutter with his axe, which is a common example that Aristotle and Aquinas will use for different types of instrumental causality, or the baseball player, right? Uh, you know, uh, however you want to look at it, that there's, um, there's an instrument. Uh, the motion of the axe or the motion of the baseball bat uh, is a sign of the effect. Uh, it's not an illusion, right? Uh, um, you know, if, if, it, if the effect is being accomplished, you see it through the medium of signs, right? Uh, so the signs of the sacraments become the means by which uh, the effect of the passion is being communicated. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about the Eucharist directly. I have um, a couple of categories here that I think are helpful for thinking about the Eucharist um, in relation to Christ's sacrificial act on the cross. One is to think about the Eucharist as a sacrificial sign. Another is to think about it as a sacrificial presence. Another way is to think about it as a sacrificial act. And finally, you can think about it as a sacrificial liturgy, right? Uh, so those um, four categories, five categories, rather, excuse me, those are ways in which Aquinas is going to break down uh, Eucharistic presence in relation to the cross, or at least it's a way of thinking about them, right? So I'd like to, in the remaining time, just go through each one of those and talk about how, um, how we can think about Eucharistic reality as a kind of signate experience, as um, placing us in a relationship with the priesthood of Christ, a living relationship. Um, and I think, I hope at least, that this can give us a vocabulary moving forward um, or at least a model, perhaps, for how we might talk about the sanctification of visible reality in Christological terms. Sacramentality, although sometimes we have an overly narrow sense of the sacraments as the big seven, um, that's, that's not false, uh, certainly. Uh, you wouldn't want to have an overly dis diffusive sense of sacramentality in which you're not sure whether or not certain things are sacraments. Um, but if you look at the uh, Peter Lombard and the Victorines and Augustine himself, um, they use the word sacramentality to talk about the way in which creation looks when it's viewed through the lens of the incarnation, right? So the, how, does, how does reality look through Christological lenses? Uh, how does it look when you see it through the eyes of faith, hope, and love? When you've allowed the sacrifice and its effects to, to reform your inner eye, it looks different, right? Uh, and so sacramentality is a way of talking about the amplification of signs, Right? Uh, we're already dealing with physical signs, like the water of baptism washing, for instance. Um, the washing part is the natural sign. If you just saw water pouring or water moving, well, that's a, it's a sign of washing, potentially, right? or something else. I don't know. But it certainly could be a sign of washing. Right? Um, so you take up that natural sign and repurpose it Christologically, or rather Christ repurposes it. Um, and the ministers of the church, at his, uh, according to his specification of the external acts of the virtue of religion, follow suit. Um, and you get a kind of language, a signate language, which is Christologically charged in such a way that visible reality, all of it, right, not just the water of baptism, the bread of the Eucharist, although those things in a preeminent and uh, a centrally important way, but everything else, literally, uh, everything else can be understood 
as a sign not only of what it is, but a sign of the eternal word himself. Right. And not only just of him, but what he's doing for us and for others. Okay, so a sacrificial sign, that's my first category. When Aquinas turns his attention to the Eucharist in question 73 of the Church of Pars, the category of sign continues to function as the primary framework in which the Eucharist is understood as a sacrament in relation to Christ's passion. Here, the threefold signification that is proper to all sacraments is applied to the Eucharist, and that's that a sacrament is a sign of a past, a present, and a future reality. Uh, those three things. Right? Uh, beyond identifying the Eucharist as a sacramental sign in the proper sense, however, in this text, Aquinas uses this same threefold understanding of sacramental signs to establish a means of understanding the Eucharist as a sacrifice, described as a sign in relation to the reality of the cross. So is it possible, without multiplying sacrifices, for example, um, without saying that Christ's action is repeated, or that the Eucharist is some sort of separate sacrifice, can you use the mediation and the analogical language of signs talk about the representation of a reality in such a way that its discrete representation, that is, our encounter with Christ in the Eucharist, is in fact uh, a, a living sacrifice itself, uh, as a kind of, we might say, an analogical extension of the, of the original and consummative event. Um, Aquinas has a way of doing that, but it requires signs. So Aquinas argues that the Eucharist, like all sacraments, can be understood as a sign of the past, the present, and the future. Concerning the past, the Eucharist is a sign of Christ's true sacrifice. In this regard, the Eucharist is named sacrifice inasmuch as it is a commemorative sign of the passion of Christ. Concerning the present, the Eucharist is named communion inasmuch as it serves as the means by which the faithful are united ecclesially to God and to each other. Finally, the Eucharist is named viaticum, as a sign of the final glory to which it orders its participants in the church. So notice that all, um, all three of these types of naming really have to do with the way in which words can be used as signs of reality. It's a kind of analogical naming, not unlike the divine names at the beginning of the Prima Pars, where we, we start to name God from visible things. Um, to speak of God analogically through naming like that, um, it may or may not signify, it depends on what kind of analogy you're using, that there's a, a connection at the level of being. Um, so Aquinas is going to say that not only there's a, um, there's a naming connection, that is, or a linguistic connection uh, between these realities, but there, there's a sort of reality, there's a connection at the level of presence uh, or being itself. Right? That's, that's where he's going to move here. Um, so as Aquinas has already established, all sacraments signify a holy reality gesturing towards the source of their own holiness, that which will be, uh, will be caused in their recipients or a final holy reality that is yet to come. So the sacraments either gesture to their source in the holiness of Christ, they gesture to the holiness that they're in the process of communicating, <laughs> or they gesture to the finality of the, the holiness in the recipients that may be yet to come or may be in progress. Uh, so that, all of that applies to the Eucharist, but something more needs to be said about the Eucharist. Uh, particularly in that middle category of how um, the Eucharists are a sign of, of, a, of a current presence, right? So from question 73, it is clear that as a sign, the Eucharist may be called a sacrifice in as much as it is a sacramental commemoration of the holiness of Christ's passion. The signifying relation that is formed between the event of Christ's passion and the reality of the Eucharist is the basis for the use of sacrificial language in the sacramental context of the Eucharist. As in the case of all sacraments, the ability to, uh, to signify a past holy reality does not exhaust the category of sacramental signification. In the case of the Eucharist, however, a special variety of sacrament is encountered. In addition to signifying past, present, and future, the Eucharist is also said to contain Christ's real presence. Inasmuch as the Eucharist is a sacramental sign of Christ's real sacramental presence under the signs of bread and wine, the term host, uh, um, hostia, is applied rather than sacrifice. So the vocabulary changes, whether we're speaking about the presence as communion or the presence as Christ contained, uh, and that's, that would be host. At the Last Supper, Christ instituted the Eucharist as both a sign of his passion 
and as a sacrament that would contain his presence. Although Christ knew that soon he would no longer be present to his disciples in bodily form, the category of sacramental signification um, enables Christ's body and blood and his passion to remain present within the life of the church. Expanding on the relationship between sacrament and reality, Aquinas argues that as a special case among the sacraments, three aspects can be discerned within the Eucharist. When the elements of bread and wine are considered alone, they appear as purely sacramental signs, which signify the holy reality to which the sacrament, uh, that is the outward signs, are related. When the Eucharist is spoken of as Christ's true body, it is both sacrament and reality. As really present, the, Eucharist, the Eucharistic reality of Christ's body is contained in a sacramental mode, Aquinas will say. Finally, inasmuch as the Eucharist is considered according to its effects, it is reality alone. So let's move to the next category um, and talk about the Eucharist as a sacrificial presence, basing ourselves on what we've, we've seen already of Aquinas' thought on the importance of, of presence and sign and the Eucharist as both um, a sacrament and the reality itself, uh, the holy reality. So as a sign, the passion of Christ, recall, was presented in the sacrifices of the old law in figure alone as foreshadowings of Christ's true passion. Citing Hebrews 10, in question 75, um, this is of the Tertia Pars, Aquinas reminds his reader that as a shadow of good things to come, the old law prefigures the new law that Christ himself institutes. The sacrifice instituted by this new law, therefore, must necessarily surpass those of the old. To this end, Aquinas argues that the new law surpasses the old by containing Christ crucified, not only by means of sign or figure, but in truth. So it's precisely this ability um, to contain the holiness itself that's signified that makes the Eucharist something different than other types of sacrifices. As a sacrament, therefore, the Eucharist is the perfection of all other sacraments, precisely because it contains Christ crucified and because it enables a participation in Christ's power. Expanding on this participatory dimension of the Eucharist, Aquinas argues that it is Christ's charity, again, the importance of Christ's charity, that provides the motive for the incarnation itself, ordered towards a kind of friendship with Christ in the context of the Church. In this regard, Christ's sharing in our nature in the incarnation anticipates his continued friendship with the members of his body that is affected by his enduring presence with them in the Eucharist. So by implication here, charity is important as an, a kind of animating principle for the interior and then following the exterior acts of religion that form the anthropological framework for Christ's passion. But for us as well, when we find a true participation in his humanity through contact with him in the Eucharist, it's the same principle of charity that animates our own, our own acts of religion, effectively, our own acts of devotion, prayer, and sacrifice considered externally. So having established this connection between Christ's passion and the sacramental presence of Christ, in question 76, Aquinas moves to consider the meaning by which the twofold species of bread and wine become the sacramental signs which contain Christ crucified. So there's two parts of the Eucharist, in case you forgot. <laughs> there's the bread and wine, right? Uh, that's going to play an important role in his understanding of um, the sacrificial presence of Christ here. So turning to the question of transubstantiation, uh, which is how the bread and wine are transubstantiated into the Eucharist by the priest, um, Aquinas argues that the independent consecration of each of these elements in succession is in fact significant for the Eucharist as a sacramental representation of Christ's passion. While he affirms that the entirety of Christ is of course present under both species, Aquinas also sees this double presence of Christ as a sign of the passion itself in which Christ's blood was separated from his body. Focusing specifically on the words of consecration for the precious blood, Aquinas notes the specific mention is made here of the shedding of Christ's blood, reinforcing the notion that the separate consecration of these distinct sacramental species is intended as a sign of the shedding of Christ's blood in his passion. So there are lots of different ways in which Aquinas talks about the Eucharist as a sacrifice. 
but this is one of the ones that's resonated perhaps most deeply in the later Catholic tradition, that the, the double consecration, and Cardinal Cajetan will talk about this at length in the 16th century and other later Thomas, that you can say the Mass, for instance, is a true sacrifice because what's done or affected um, in, uh, in the Mass by the priest is a, a kind of, as Aquinas will say in the second part of the second part that we studied yesterday, it is really a kind of change that's being affected or something being done. And what's happening is not that Christ is being re-crucified or anything like that, but mystically, to use Cajetan's language, which is just another way of talking about the category of sign, but specifying that those signs are Christological rather than just any old sign, um, that mystically Christ's, um, Christ's actual crucifixion is being signified uh, through the sacramental actions of the church. Um, so let's talk about the Eucharist as a sacrificial act then. That's my second category, right? So a sacrificial sign, a sacrificial act, um, and a sacrificial presence, and a sacrificial liturgy. <laughs> so um, from the above, it's clear that Aquinas, um, that for Aquinas, the sacrificial character of the Eucharist is deeply embedded within the sacramental nature of the Eucharist as a sign of Christ's passion and the sanctification uh, that the Eucharist affects. When discussing the effects of the Eucharist as a sacrament, this is in question 79, Aquinas does distinguish the concepts of sacrifice and sacrament more clearly, um, even as the reality of the Eucharist itself encompasses the unique features of each. As a reality that is both offered and received, the Eucharist has the ratio of sacrifice in the former sense and that of sacrament in the latter. So in as much as it's offered, it's a sacrifice. In as much as it's received, it's a sacrament. Um, Aquinas is writing long before uh, the 16th 16th century Reformation debates about uh, sacrament and sacrifice in the Christian liturgy. Um, some of the objections raised by Luther and Calvin would uh, really challenge the sacrificial character, for instance, of the Eucharistic liturgy. But you can see Aquinas here clearly distinguishing the, the concepts of sacrament and sacrifice in a way that assigns independent roles to each in the economy of salvation. So if it were just a sacrament, you would really lose uh, the, the sense of offering, right? Um, so another way to think about it, uh, and we, we, won't, we don't need to get detained too far uh, with the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> another way to think about it is what do you bring to the Eucharist? You, you don't make the Eucharist, you don't contribute to it in that sense, obviously, but you bring yourself, your own humanity. How does your humanity interact with the Eucharist, right? Um, for priests, obviously, there's a liturgical offering of the Eucharist. But what it highlights here, I think, for Aquinas, in Aquinas' mind, is the importance, again, of that anthropology of the virtue of religion for all of us. If communion is meant to be real, that is, the, the current presence that the Eucharist signifies, then something about our humanity needs to be activated, as it were, in, by, the, by the presence and life of the Eucharist. And that's um, part of what Aquinas is trying to capture when he says sacrifice here. Not just that the Eucharist is a sign for us of something that Christ did, but that participation in it is actively affecting something and drawing something out of us and divinizing some aspect of our humanity. Okay, so we talked about sacrifice as a sign and as an act, right? Uh, we talked about it, uh, and that's just in the sacramental context of the Eucharist, right? But even moving beyond the idea of, of the Mass or the Eucharist as an act, for instance, that's principally offered by the priests, but analogously, um, you know, as the faithful join their own hearts to the offering, you have a, an analogous participation there as well. There's another way in which Aquinas, at least according to my reading, uh, talks about the Eucharist as a sacrifice in the language of sign here in the Tertia Pars. And this is moving to question 83, uh, where he has, he has a lot to say about the structure of the Mass here. Uh, in case you didn't notice, the Mass is filled with signs. All liturgy is. Uh, the liturgy itself is replete with sacred signs. So when we say that the world through Christological eyes is rendered sacramental, um, we're not just saying um, that the, we're not just talking about the Eucharist or baptism, we're also by extension talking about the liturgical context in which those sacraments are rightly situated. Um, Aquinas repeatedly, when he talks about the difference between, let's say sacraments with a capital S and the liturgical context in which they live, will distinguish between uh, what's essential to a sacrament and then also the liturgical solemnity, as he likes to put it, that's appropriate for the sacrament. So you might have um, a valid baptism with just some pretty basic conditions being met, right? Uh, but there's also um, 
it's, <laughs> well, there's a time and a place for emergency baptisms, uh, but there's also, in, in the ordinary flow of things, you would, you would celebrate it with due liturgical solemnity, uh, right? You, you celebrate it in a church and according to the rite of the church, for instance, and um, with the right vestments and so on and so forth. Okay. So that, all that has to say is that just the, the broader liturgical context is not insignificant. Um, you don't want to get so caught up in like the metaphysics of Eucharistic presence, as fascinating as that is, don't get me wrong, um, that you lose track of the broader liturgical context. Because there's a great richness uh, to the, the sign or the signet quality of the liturgy, which uh, shouldn't be underestimated here. So, okay. So this is question 83 of the Tertia Pars. Um, and this concludes Aquinas' treatment of the Eucharist. So taken as a whole, this question is focused on the liturgical ritual in which the Church offers the Eucharist as sacrifice and receives its fruit sacramentally. Aquinas has already established a sacramental connection between the Eucharist and the Passion in the order of sign, and identified that dimension of the Eucharist in which sacrifice as a moral act of the virtue of religion constitutes a form of participation in this sacrament. So those are the two, two um, that, that sacrifice as, as an act, sacrifice as a sign, right? Um, so in the first article of question 83, therefore, Aquinas turns his attention to the rite itself. So what type of fitting liturgical ritual uh, should accompany this? Uh, and here he's asking whether Christ himself is immolated or sacrificed in some sense during the course of the sacrament's celebration. Now, that's a related question, but I would submit it's a slightly different one, at least in terms of its focus. So here Aquinas is adopting a more liturgical focus, right, um, rather than a strictly anthropological or signate one. So in the said contra of this article, um, this is, again, the first article of 83, Aquinas invokes a pseudo-Augustinian text, which appears in Lombard sentences, uh, that likely originated with Lanfranc, uh, who, uh, and was first attributed to Augustine by Algier of Liege if you're interested. But, so, <laughs> although, um, although, and here it is, so although Christ was sacrificed or immolated, you might say immolari is the Latin, right? um, he was immolated or sacrificed once in his person, he has sacrificed daily in sacrament. So all this is to say, using this pseudo-Augustinian text, um, Aquinas is going back to the category of sacramental sign as the way in which not only the um, act of sacrifice itself, or the anthropological dimension, or the signet dimension, but the liturgical dimension is going to be understood. So in the corpus of this article, 83, Aquinas expands on this, arguing that the celebration of the sacrament of the Eucharist may be named a sacrifice for two reasons. To illustrate the first, Aquinas uses a text from Augustine's letter to Simplician, where Augustine argues that images of other things derive their names from those things that they image. Um, and this is a really interesting example. So Augustine gives a, um, a sort of illustration of what he means. So I'll just read that again. So we're, um, so we're following Augustine's logic here. Um, images of other things derive their names from those things that they image. So in the case of a picture of Cicero, we point to the painting and say that it is the man, when in fact it is the image, right? So there is Cicero. Well, it's a painting of him. It's not actually him but we, we name the sign from what it signifies. Aquinas has already made it, uh, made it clear that as a sacrament, the Eucharist is named a sacrifice by virtue of its reference to the past event of Christ's passion. What appears as a development here in question 83 is not this principle as such, but rather the fact that it is specifically applied to the celebration of the Eucharistic liturgy taken as a whole, uh, not just any particular part rather than simply to the sacramentality of the signs of bread and wine that, are sign that, that also signify the present holiness of Christ crucified. Although Aquinas has previously indicated that individual components of the Eucharistic liturgy, such as words, actions, and liturgical vessels, can function as signs of the passion, and here recall his previous description of the, um, uh, the words used to consecrate the chalice, for instance, by the priest, even the, sometimes maybe the, the, chal the chalice itself is a receptacle of, of the, the, the wine or the blood of Christ as being a kind of sign. So more than just individual liturgical elements or individual uh, liturgical vessels or uh, other types of things, uh, it's the liturgy taken as a whole rather than any single part that signifies Christ crucified. 
So because the Eucharistic liturgy uh, is an image of Christ's sacrifice, the celebration of this liturgy is said to be a sacrifice itself. So at least um, in my reading of 83, and I'm not alone in this, uh, so, you know, other, other scholars tend to um, see something similar in 83, that when Aquinas, you know, there are places where he pinpoints specific uh, moments in the Mass, uh, where the, so this is the sacrifice and not this part. This becomes super important for uh, the later Thomistic tradition, and it's an important question. But um, it's also important not to lose track of the fact that although he's already talked about uh, the sacrificial act of the Mass earlier, here he's really naming the liturgy itself as a sign uh, itself of the Passion, right? So the whole liturgy, as it were, in all of its components and taken as a whole, uh, not as the action of one, but really as an action of the collective whole of the church, is a sign of the passion. So what have we seen here uh, across these three lectures, right? We've seen the importance that sign plays in the sort of basic metaphysics or epistemology that Aquinas uses to understand God and the human person. We've also seen the importance of the category of sign for human acts, right? Today, I've tried to establish the importance of these same concepts, right, for um, understanding the incarnation and particularly the sacrament of the Eucharist uh, as a kind of supreme example of Christian sacramentality, for how these kind of basic concepts for understanding reality in the human person can be sacramentalized and actually how they, how they are rightly sacramentalized by divine precept. So the Eucharist, we didn't make that up. Uh, right, we, we didn't respond to the event of the incarnation. Like, oh, I know what would be great. You know, we'll, um, you know, first we'll, <laughs> you know, uh, and we've got these great clothes we'll wear too, and we'll lay it all out, and it'll be no. It, it's a, it's a response to divine precept, right? Uh, that uh, you know, do this in remembrance of me, right? Uh, liturgical traditions grow up around that, uh, perhaps, right? But the the essence uh, of the liturgy itself, the essence of the sacraments, is instituted by Christ. And there's a fitting anthropological perfection to that, even according to nature, all the more so according to grace. What I'd like to propose, uh, particularly for our, um, our conversations about the importance of aesthetics and art and artistic production, is that our own experience with the incarnation through the medium of signs as a supernatural perfection of our own humanity, both uh, individually and collectively as a church, can form as a, a kind of archetype for us for understanding what it means to um, engage signs uh, according to the pattern of the incarnation. So as an artist, for example, I think we can take the incarnation and the sacraments of the church as a certain pattern, right? a certain archetype, not to be uh, slavishly copied, uh, because art has to do with form right? more than just reproduction, simple reproduction. But the form itself, when it's understood and encountered and imbibed, right, uh, provides the ability and the wherewithal to act um, out of that form, right, uh, to represent it as a kind of living mimesis. And if we look at the Christian life, that's effectively what we're being asked to do in grace, right? Um, if art imitates God, uh, imitates his essence, and we uh, as human artists are contextualized by divine artistry all the way back at the beginning in the act of creation, in recreation something similar is going on. So whether we're talking about the moral life or the fine arts, um, the the exemplarity of the incarnation and the sacramental economy itself can serve as a model for us. Um, so uh, with that, I'll take your questions. Yes. I, I took it that you're claiming the reason why we can call it sign, uh, so you said this quote about images derived their name from those. Yeah, the Cicero thing, the, yeah. 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 Is that true of both types of the sacrifices? Like the Cicero example, if I, if I tell the guy, hey, but that's not really Cicero, right? And you go, yeah, it's like Cicero. But I, I want to say that's the case. So, so when the priest holds up the, the host at Mass, right, and says, uh, behold the Lamb of God, right, um, what do you see in the host, right? You, you don't, I mean, you don't see Jesus' face, right, or something like that. And the way that you, you'd see, it's not like he's holding up a picture of Cicero, it's, you know, uh, behold, right? Here's, here he is. It's, but it is an image, right? Uh, but it's an image of the Last Supper, right? Where, where Christ himself said, take this, this is my body, right? Do this in remembrance of me. So you're right in a sense. It's not a visual image of, of Christ's face or his corporality, but it's an image of of the, the first Eucharist, as it were, uh, right? Where is that? Is that? Yeah, 
Jeff, yeah, sure. I, I agree to image. Uh, I want to say something that it's not um, merely that sacrifice in virtue of the fact that there's more going on, just like the fact that Jesus is the icon of God, not because going on. I would say the same thing about the Eucharist. It's not yeah. merely, I mean, I agree that that's happening, but that's not the only thing that's happening. We want to say that it's a sacrifice in a much more than sense. Yes. But merely that it refers to something. Exactly. Yes, because Martin Luther would affirm that much, but he wouldn't go any farther, right? He'd say, it's a, it's sure, it's a sign. Yeah, I'll agree with you there. But so the second, or was it the third of my categories? So my, my categories, again, just for reference, if you care, uh, were a sacrificial sign, sacrificial presence, sacrificial act, and a sacrificial liturgy. So that third one, sacrificial act, that's where you get the anthropology uh, at work. We're like, so how can we say that the Mass is a sacrifice offered, right? Um, that's something, and we do say that, right? And Aquinas says that. So he provides a way of talking about the performance of certain liturgical acts as an offering of a sacrifice. Um, furthermore, even the, the second category is sacrifice, uh, 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 sorry, sacrificial uh, presence, right? So beyond just a sacrificial sign, when we talk about the Eucharist, we're also talking about presence. So the, the sacrifice itself is present. So the sacrifice is signified, the sacrifice of Christ is present, and then the the performance, the, and here it is, it's not so much the, the, the distinction between the last two categories, again, these are my, my categories, right, so, um, is so much, it, it's really more of, a, uh, of emphasis, right, so are you talking about the mass or the liturgy as something that, uh, are you talking about the signs of the liturgy, right, uh, the signs you encounter, are you talking about the human act that uh, is required to perform certain signs, those are two slightly different questions, so when you talk about the human act, that's that whole anthropology from the Secunda Pars really applied to the priest primarily, but by extension, the laity gathered as well, uh, where that anthropology animated by charity comes into play. You know, particularly the example was of the double consecration where the priest consecrates one species and then the other. There's a mystical signification, as the later Thomistic tradition would say, of, of the crucifixion there. I mean, Aquinas says that too. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, the language of mystical sounds, uh, well, I don't know what it sounds like to modern ears exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's meant specifically as, as a way of talking about Christological signs, right? So, um, so all of that is encompassed here, right? But when we go back to just talk about the liturgy, so how is the liturgy, is the liturgy itself in its, all of its signs and in its, not just in any one sign, but in its progression from one sign through to the others from opening to close, taken as a whole, you can call that a sacrifice as well. And Aquinas in 83 breaks down all of its parts and talks about it sort of one, one piece at a time, you know. Uh, but there, at least in my reading, he's really talking about it as a, a kind of a sign, but it's really the whole thing in its progression that's, uh, that's an image, if you will, of the crucifixion, you know. Uh, so all of those perspectives are super important, I, I think, when we talk about the, the Eucharist and um, our own engagement with it. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm wondering in what sense we can say that the Eucharist is both a sign of Christ and also the real presence of Christ, like signified and signified at the same time, and how that can be true without some kind of contradiction. Okay, yeah. Um, well, it's kind of a singular thing, right? You know, um, if you can think of something else like it, let me know. Uh, I mean, you can't, so it's, uh, it's not good. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, so you're talking about, um, it's an exception to the rules of metaphysics uh, that's uh, sustained by divine power. So it's not something, but it's not arbitrary, right? In the ratio of God's plan for creation and for redemption, it, it, it does have a ratio, but it's not, the, the language of physical substance and the, the normal language of subsistence that we use to talk about everything else, basically, it, it applies only analogically, uh, in, in a sense, because there's a specific form of divine power and divine intervention going on here. So we would say that the, um, you know, the accidents, those are the sort of external appearances of bread and wine remain, uh, but uh, the, the substance itself uh, of Christ is what's present. So the accidents of, of something else, of bread and wine, are signifying the presence of Christ uh, here. So you have kind of a, um, a metaphysical singularity, right, uh, sustained by divine power here uh, that's, uh, that's not exactly like anything else. But the ratio for it comes 
not from natural physics or metaphysics, but from the incarnation itself. Um, as a culmination of the power of the incarnation in the present, I think that's fitting that the, the categories of normal metaphysics and physics yield a little bit, right? Um, because that normal mode of encounter with God that we have in the primo pars through the, the analogy of being and the mediation of signs, that's not good enough to talk about communion and grace. Um, the, the indwelling of the spirit and the son in the, the faculties of knowing and loving that he alludes to in the prima pars, to really encounter that sacramentally, you're going to need something more uh, than just the kind of normal way you might know God according to reason or, or a way which you might account, encounter him through other signs. So there's a fittingness to that, but it is an exception in a sense. Um, yeah. I thought you said that our participation in the sacramental act and, or the sacramental uh, liturgy mm -hmm. ritual is analogous to the priest. Could you say a little bit more about this? Yes, so I, um, what I meant by that, um, when Aquinas is talking about the, the Mass as, a, as an offered sacrifice, he's primarily talking about what the priest does at Mass. So, like, for instance, uh, consecrating the, the body and blood of Christ. I mean, the, he's talking about what the priest does up at the altar when, when all that's happening. But he's also providing a way in which you can see the anthropology, first and foremost, of the priest there, the, uh, through the act of religion, sort of being activated, right, uh, and used in a liturgical setting. By extension or by analogy, uh, when, when uh, we, if I'm not celebrating, for instance, I mean, so for instance, Father Leg is going to celebrate the Mass in a, in a few moments here. I'll, I'll just be there as a participant, right, even though I'm a priest. It's, um, you know, you can, you can unite your own act of religion in charity to what's being offered on the altar, which is what we're encouraged to do as participants in the Eucharist, right? So there's... Um, all I meant by that was simply to say that the, what Aquinas is specifically talking about is a priestly action, but to use the, uh, the language of the priesthood, the baptized, if you want, there's a broader sense in which sacrificial offering is made as a, as a personal act, right, or as a, an act of the heart, uh, according to the, the language of the secunda parts for Aquinas. Um, is that, yeah, sorry. I think we're, we're out of time. All right, great. Thank you all.